Welcome to our June garden. At this point in the growing season, the hustle of spring planting is over. There's no longer a threat of frost and growth around us is really starting to take off. Our attention in June can shift towards setting up some supporting structures like trellises and walk-in tunnels, taking care of the first pruning, and even bringing in some of the first big harvest from the field. In this video, I'll share some lessons from our activities in this past month. I'll show you how we use transplants to establish beds really quickly in spring, how we turn over a bed from one crop to the next, how we prune our determinate tomato plants, and more. Let's get into it. Here at our Avenue H plot, I'll remind you first that we're just again keeping things really simple here. Um, despite that though, if you were to walk by this plot a few weeks ago, there would be almost nothing here and all of a sudden it's come to life. So I'm going to reveal a few techniques that have helped me make that transition really quick and easy here for us in this low maintenance plot today. So these first three beds here were not planted last time and in just three weeks um, from planting, they're already looking this lively. So we've got corn. Uh, a glass gem corn here that we're going to use for um, cornmeal and flour and borlotti beans here that we'll use for harvesting just dried beans for long-term storage. I transplanted both of these crops which is not a typical thing you would do for corn and beans but it gives us a really fast start and it allows these crops to totally dominate their growing space very quickly so there's much less weed competition. In the case of beans they get great coverage over the bed. In the case of corn their coverage is a little worse so I took advantage of some landscape fabric that we had already made, spacing was right. So despite the, the fact that corn leaves a bunch more soil exposed where weeds could start to take hold, in this case, since we've got the landscape fabric in play, there's no chance for the weeds. So great start for these three crops. And to accelerate the, the bean growth even further, to allow me to transplant them and be happy at the end of May, I had a floating row cover over small galvanized hoops here to help them get a good start as well. I'll show you a clip of that. Uh, the next crop that we transplanted was another warm season crop. We've got four beds of squash interplanted with our peas here. Now you can start to see this interplanting that's kind of going to take place in a few weeks. The peas are now flowering, so that indicates to us that in two weeks we'll start to have mature pods here ready to go. Uh, we'll have about a harvest period of 10 to 14 days from these peas, and after that the peas can come out, they won't need the space anymore and the squash will at then, that point be ready to just sprawl over this whole garden. Because this squash, as big as it is right now, it's only been here for three weeks at this point. And again, we've accelerated that growth and enhanced the, those growing conditions with the, um, just small, really simple floating row cover tunnels with those same galvanized hoops. So getting these squash established was as simple as bringing the transplants out here, popping them in the holes, giving them a really good soak to start with covering them with the floating fabric and then just letting the drip irrigation do the work after that. Um, the only issue I had with that process was forgetting to turn one of the drip lines on. So there still is a small margin of human error, but if you get all those details right, then the plants should be able to take care of themselves. We'll start our boulevard tour here this month in an area where we've got a transition happening right now. I've just harvested these beds of baby spinach beside me a few days ago. I've covered them with landscape fabric and I'm about to clean out these beds and direct seed carrots here. These will be our fall carrots. I know that I have to plant them this week in order to get them to mature by the end of fall before things freeze up. So this is an important deadline for me to meet. I had a bit of wiggle room here because I harvested the spinach at an ideal stage about 10 days ago. So I could have planted carrots anytime between then and now, but I know I can't procrastinate any longer. So this is a good opportunity also for me to show you how we flip these beds and get carrots in the ground. Now I didn't have to cover these beds with landscape fabric, but the bonus for me in doing that is that I maintain the soil moisture so I can turn off the irrigation and you don't have to worry about things getting really crusty here before I want to prep these beds for the next round. The covers also help shed those elm seeds that you saw falling in the previous plot. They're everywhere right now and if I were to leave these beds exposed, I would have just allowed thousands of elm seeds to drop into this bed right before I turn up the soil a little bit to seed carrots. So I would have essentially been seeding thousands of elm seeds alongside my carrots. But since I covered the soil, I avoid that. The last small benefit is that I'm killing the spinach a little bit in this waiting period. But since the waiting period was so short, there's not a huge benefit for that last element there. So I'll let the camera roll here as I show you the process.
this is why I make such an effort to remove all the debris before tilting and before using the cedar. It takes some time to get in there with a, with a hoe and clear all this stuff out, but if you don't have time to wait for it to die and shrivel up completely, then that time is, is worth it so that you can get in there with the tilter and have a nice clean bed to start off with. turnover routine and I've got the option of using any type of cover at this point. If I was concerned about maintaining moisture I could add landscape fabric to keep the top inch or two of the soil really moist during the germination period for these carrots but I know that rain is coming a lot this week in the forecast so I think I'd rather just leave them open and let that water soak in really nicely into the bed. If I was still concerned about elm seeds falling from the sky and landing on these beds I could also cover them with insect netting just to make sure that I can easily wipe those seeds to the side when I take the netting off. But the elm seeds have pretty much wrapped up for the season. I don't think that's a big concern either. So my top choice I think in this case is just to leave them open. The soil's warm at this point so germination should be pretty quick in seven to nine days I would guess. We'd start to see some carrots popping up here and so that's a relatively short period for me to have to maintain good moisture level over the top of these beds if I do need to come out and water them by hand once or twice during the week just to make sure we get good germination, I'm happy to do that task. So let's move on to the next areas in this plot. Um, this tunnel, I guess, is the next thing. I filmed myself while I was setting this up because I've been getting a lot of questions about the netted tunnel over there. This has been a dream of mine for a while because we used to just have either netting draped over the strawberries, which doesn't work because the strawberry fruit gets totally tangled in the netting, birds can still poke their way through, that's, that's a failure. You could also put hoops, just the low tunnel hoops, in the ground and have a much lower netted tunnel. And that kind of works and that's what we've been doing for the last few years, but every time you need to get in there to access the strawberries, you have to pull off the netting and it inevitably gets hooked on your boots and stuff and, and still tangled on the, on the strawberry plants as well, so that was annoying. So the dream was to have this walk-in tunnel and now we've finally made it happen. I'll just start by playing the the video footage for the assembly of this and we'll talk about some of the details after that.
So hopefully that assembly video was pretty clear. There are more details that you're welcome to ask about. The main weakness of this tunnel system is this coupling here. It's a pretty short joint. It's only about three and three and a half inches in height. So if, if you felt that you were uh, your structure was weak, this would be the first area to strengthen. But I, I found that by adding that top bar along the, the center of the top ridge there between each of these ribs, we really do have a pretty stable structure here. And there's no wind load because the, the netting doesn't catch the wind. Even the insect netting doesn't catch the wind too badly. But if you were out on an acreage setting, that this could be the first aspect that you might want to consider strengthening. But considering that these posts are, are tamped straight into the ground, they're pretty stiff, stiffly anchored there, and this joint, I found, doesn't, doesn't move too much for us. The opening was a little different with our, our netted tunnel here, because I don't have a slit in the front. Our insect netting tunnel, we just, we have uh, two pieces of insect netting that overlap a little bit here, and we just part them a little bit to walk in. But I didn't want to go cutting this netting right away here, so what I've done to maintain the tension on this whole netting is just to add tomato clips here. So we've pulled this netting tight. So this end wall is, can be as loose as I want without having everything else sag in for the rest of the tunnel. So now to, to enter, like you saw in the video, we can just remove these bricks, slide in, and not worry about the whole piece of netting collapsing there on us. So that's working for us now. If you have a better idea for the, the opening, please let me know. Maybe we'll switch it up. Now, Onto tomatoes, where we've got a full bed of determinate plum regal tomatoes. This is a, a paste tomato that's going to be our tomato sauce for the winter. My method of choice for supporting determinate tomatoes would be cages, large ones, strong ones, but these can run at five dollars a piece, so by the time you're supporting a whole row of determinate tomatoes, they can get pretty pricey. So when we've got a larger patch of determinate tomatoes, uh, a cheaper method, what still works fine is to put some stakes in the ground along the row of your tomatoes and use the floor to weave. But our main job right now with these tomatoes is to prune them. Yes, even though they're determinate tomatoes, we want to prune them. And I've got some examples here to show you. This zone right here has already been pruned as we should for determinate tomatoes. What I've done here is first look for the the first flower cluster and then we we follow that path down toward the bottom of the plant to find out what we need to prune. What you'll notice at the first leaf below that flower cluster is a really strong sucker. We want to keep that one. That's been shown to be really productive. But every sucker below that is just going to look like a, a little guy like this, at least when it starts to emerge. It won't be quite as dominant as this one. We're going to take all of those out. So, And I've already done that on this example here. So that one's gone, that one's gone, right down to the base of the plant. And even the leaves that are resting on the surface of the soil, we want to cut those out too. The pruning of the lower leaves is even more important out in the field where you have more splashing of soil and a higher need to keep your, your plants clean. But this next zone hasn't been pruned at all. So I've set, kept this for an example so you can see what I'm actually cutting out here. So if we come in close again, we'll do the same process here and you'll actually see what gets removed. So I'll start by finding my first flower cluster, right there. Here's the strongest sucker that we want to allow to remain and all these other suckers below can pinch off. The ones at the bottom here are getting a little larger, so I'm actually cutting them to get a clean clean cut, I'm not just tearing and making a mess of that wound in the plant. And we've got a couple of leaves here that are basically just on the ground. I'm going to remove that as well. And this sucker I missed here. There we go. So big difference there. We took a lot of greenery away from that plant. Let's do the next one as well. This one's got a lot of suckers coming from the bottom here. But we don't start, well you can start there if you want, but the safest place to start to make sure you don't go too far is to find that first flower cluster again. Let me go down here, this is the, the first sucker coming up. It almost looks like a whole another leader on its own, it's so strong in this case. But the, the first not so strong sucker is right here on the back. 
snip that off. Now, some of these at the bottom here are are large already that you might be confused and start to think that they're they're more than just a sucker. So you always can determine whether it's a sucker or not by looking what's happening at this joint. So here's the main stem, the thickest one. Here's the leaf running off to the side, and that sucker is coming out of that that armpit there. It's not part of that main stem. Couple leaves on the ground, and done. So that is the recommended pruning method for determinate tomatoes. From this point on, we do nothing because this a determinate plant has a set number of branches that is, and fruit that it's going to produce up here. It's not like an indeterminate tomato plant that will continue to produce indefinitely as long as conditions are good. As June comes to a close now, our energy can shift away from these basic setup activities and focus more on regular harvesting and pruning to maximize the harvest from all of these great crops we've got established now. I hope that the lessons I shared this month introduced you to a few new ideas and methods that you can try implementing in your garden at home. These were just a few clips from the full plot tours that I offered to our members every month during the growing season. If you're serious about growing your own food, leave a comment below and let me know what subjects you'd like to see included in more garden tour selections in the future. See you in the next one.